this time on The Gadget Show. We've got wind, and lots of it. And we're putting it to very good use as Gail and I go head-to-head testing brilliant wind-powered transport tech. woo That's so quick! Tested to destruction is back. This time we're putting the wind up some supposedly rugged digital cameras. John gets the closest to crazy he's ever been when he goes for a drive with singer Katie Mellower to test the very best in car stereos. And Otis builds the ultimate gadget chair. And do you know what the best bit is? You could win it in this week's competition. It's going to look good. Hello and welcome to The Gadget Show. Yes, and this week's challenge is all about what happens when you harness the power of wind. Yes, <laughs> and obvious jokes aside, actually, there's lots of fun to be had when you harness the power of wind. Yep, this week's challenge is all about the awesome fun that you can have with wind-related tech. And I've got to say, I think it's one of the most technically and physically demanding challenges we've ever done. For the first part of our windswept challenge, we headed down to the beach at Western Supermare as we were going to be harnessing the full power of that wind whipping off the sea. It's incredibly windy. There's a huge expanse of beach behind me. It's too cold to go in the water, which can mean only one thing. We're going to have a beach race. We're testing two of the fastest wind-powered devices around in a head-to-head -head winner takes all battle. Yes! We were going to be racing against each other in a time trial on the beach to find out which is the best wind-powered racing gadget. I'd be using this, the Blowcard, a unique mini land yacht, basically a three-wheeled buggy propelled by a hand-controlled sail. It was invented in New Zealand ten years ago and it's built to be quick. Blowcards can reach speeds of over 60 miles an hour. I'd be using the Kitewing Rage 55, a wing-shaped kite, which can be used as a wind-powered engine for anything from dirt boards to inline skates to surfboards. Its adaptable design can harness some serious speed and get you some big air. Before testing our racing tech under time trial conditions, we got down to some serious training. So this is how my blow cart works. I sit nice and low to the ground on my steel chassis here. My sail size is dependent on the weather. Today it's really windy, so I've got the smallest sail size I could get, which is a two meter sail. It's basically sailing on sand. I control my movement with my handlebars here. I've got a sheet rope attached to my sail here, which will harness the wind. Should be relatively easy to get started. Famous last words. <laughs> Woo. The gusting 30 mile an hour winds made for some Ooh. testing conditions. Wow. Oh, this is so fast. It's faster than I expected. Well, hey, hey. But the stainless steel frame and fiberglass mast of the blow cart have been built to withstand the inevitable bumps. Wait. <sighs> Ooh, my first fall. Since I'm not a sailor, I found the sheet rope quite tricky to master. But other than that, I felt pretty <laughs> stable despite the speed I was going and the ferocious wind. I thought I did really well. And how Jace is getting on. My kite wing was designed to cope with a range of wind conditions, but I was mainly just trying to keep it under control while working out... Woo! ..the best wheels to use it with. The thing with a kite wing is, it's meant to be incredibly versatile. You can use it on just about anything that moves. That is, of course, assuming that you've got the art of using the thing sussed, which at this point, I've got to say, is eluding me a little bit. Yep, that five square metre Dacron and monofilm sail has been shaped to provide maximum pull from the airstream. Oh, oh my And it was seriously hard work as I struggled to control that wind. But eventually the kite wing and I began to work in harmony. Whoa, it's been quick. Oh! Sort of. After a few hours gruelling practice, it was time to prepare for battle. We were to have one run each up and down our 150 metre beach course to decide which of these gadgets was the best wind-powered racing toy. And I was up first in my blow cart. Three, two, one, go! I was off and I was determined to get as quick a start as I could. Perhaps a bit too determined. I'd love to pretend, but I didn't find that hilarious. I just did. I'm, I'm a bad person. Luckily for me, the blow cart was soon back on track, with that vertical wing powering my lightweight buggy down the beach. It's so fast. The tighter I pull the rope, it makes it go even faster. We're going to be careful I don't go up on two wheels. I just needed to take the turn in one piece. Please don't fall, please don't fall. I think I've done it. Um, yes, and I'm back on track. That's what I'm talking about. 
Always a good time now. One minute, six seconds so far. Come on, Gail! Yep, as I headed back towards the finish, I was definitely making up for lost time. This is absolutely fantastic. It's so simple and effective to use. I love it. This should be a good time. One minute, 90. One minute, 20. Yes! One minute, 21. Stop it at one minute. 22 seconds and 72 hundredths of a second. Wow, that is some time to beat, even with the fall. This was going to be tough. Come on now. Three, two, one, go! Well, it wasn't quite a blistering start, but the Kaiwing isn't built for just straight line speed. I was hoping if I stayed on my feet, I'd be in with a chance. <sighs> Trying to micromanage the angle of that wing just to give me the lift I need and the speed. Oh, I'm getting quicker. There, there we go. My speed was improving, and because of Gail's crash, I was still in with a shout as I turned to head for home. Come on, quick! But I then began to find I wasn't quite mastering that wind direction. I'm not sure where he's going. I think he's going to Wales. Oops. Oh, I was exhausted and my chances of victory were evaporating before my eyes. I've beaten him already, and I fell. Well, I'm going to go for lunch and come back. But with my last reserve of energy, I mustered one final push. woo -hoo! That was so quick! That was more like it. I may have crossed the line almost off the course, but at least I finished. You and this device were made for each other. Fantastic. And I wasn't scared or anything. And no, it was going really fast. That's why I kept throwing you out, because you just <laughs> would not stop. <laughs> but um, timing-wise... Yes, I thought you might ask me that. Two minutes and 30-something seconds. <laughs> uh, so I won. Yes, you <laughs> won. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about your car's in-car entertainment system. These days, unless you're entering your Ford Cortina into a classic car rally, that period radio cassette just won't do. You'll be wanting things like MP3 and Bluetooth connectivity, a built-in sat-nav, maybe even video playback. But however advanced your tech, the question remains, which one's best? Well, to find out, I assembled three likely-looking contenders and went for a drive with someone who knows a thing or two about music. This is Katie Melua, the super-talented singer-songwriter who has sold a whopping 10 million albums. And these are three identical cars that have each been professionally fitted with one of our entertainment systems. Katie! Hi, John. How are you? Lovely to meet you very well. Thank you. Now, in-car entertainment systems must be very important to you on tour. What are the main things you look for? Well, I think, obviously, usability, because you want to be able to, you know, use it quite quickly and efficiently, and the quality of the sound. Right, so we've got three cars, three systems. Let's start with car number one. All three have touch screens, AM and FM radios, play CDs and DVDs, and can be used to make hands-free phone calls. But how do they compare for usability, screen clarity and sound quality? In car one, we had the Pioneer F900BT, the cheapest of our three setups, which has a 5.8-inch non-tilting screen and front SD card slot. But despite our eagerness to hit the road, we noticed a problem. Yeah, this does take a while to come on. Come on. <laughs> might be missing something. It's all the news headlines. <laughs> <laughs> After 40 seconds, we were up and running, and the friendly interface was winning Katie back. It's gone, gone for the Japanese thing, which is sort of cartoony and clear and ah. sort of simple, so I like that. Mm. Next, Katie tried the Pioneer's sat-nav, which will show you 3D landmarks. I think the interface is really nice. The way the map is laid out, the clarity is pretty good. It looks very tasteful, actually, yes fonts and the colours. Oh, it's great. Yeah. But for DVD playback, the screen leaves a bit to be desired. It's not a really great sort of quality of visuals. Mm. Um, and also, I think the colour contrast isn't very good. Like, in the dark areas, you can't really make out what's going on on screen. Hooking your iPod up to the Pioneer requires an optional cable, but it's a good interface based on a replica control wheel. That looks pretty good. I get an option of artists, songs, mm. pick out albums. Yep. So I have full control, which is really good. Keen to scrutinise the sound quality, Katie then popped in one of her albums. I'm not so sure about the sound quality. Um, there seems to be a lot of sibilance that you get. It feels like the high end of the sound is raised, then at the same time there doesn't seem to be a lot of width to the sound. So, despite a friendly interface, the Pioneer's slightly let down by its sound and picture quality. 
but how would system number two fare? Alpine's W505R has a 7-inch tilting screen that incorporates a dockable sat-nav unit, which can be removed and used in other cars. That's pretty handy. Mm. The boot-up time was a relatively swift 10 seconds, but the navigation interface left us a bit cold. I don't think it's as clear or as sharp as the first car. Graphically, it's not quite as pretty, I don't think, as the Pioneer. However, the Alpine's superior screen makes for more pleasurable DVD viewing. I can really see the colour contrast a lot better. I can see when it's a dark scene. I can't believe how much better the Alpine's visual is when you're watching a DVD. The iPod interface, on the other hand, was a little disappointing. So you get the same options, it's just not mm. presented in, in a simple way. You just have to go around a few corners. So we moved on to sound quality, and Katie immediately noticed a difference. The Alpine is slightly better. You get a little bit more space, there's a bit more width to the sound. You, you can hear the separate instruments and components a little bit better. Despite a good sound and top-notch screen, the overall Alpine experience was tarnished by its interface. Would our most expensive offering, Kenwood's 9240BT, be any better? It also has a 7-inch WVGA screen, comes with an infrared remote and has built-in Garmin sat-nav software. I think the Kenwood is definitely winning on the navigation front. It's just a clearer image, the interface is better, it seems to be a lot easier to use. The iPod interface was very clear and we found the menus easy to navigate. Yeah, that's pretty good, it's very easy to use. When playing DVDs, you can reverse tilt the screen to help eliminate glare. Yeah, this Kenwood screen is much better than the Pioneer, but it's not as good as an Alpine, which seems to be the best out of the three for visuals. Finally, it was time for the all-important sound test, so we loaded Katie's CD into the Kenwood and opened our ears. It is a, quite a big improvement on the Alpine and the uh, Pioneer. The high end just seems to have a bit more space. It's not a sort of crush sounding and it's not a sort of sibilant sounding. You just get a fuller sort of landscape of sound, which is, which is really good. Mm. So the Kenwood had shaded it on sound quality, but which system did Katie prefer overall? The Kenwood is definitely my favorite. It is the most expensive, but it does have the best sound, the best sat nav, and the best ease of use. I just wish it had the Alpine's DVD player. The clear winner. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Wasn't Katie lovely? She's great, and she's really interested in hi-fi. Right, let's go with G ratings. Mm. First up, the Pioneer, John. Three Gs for the Pioneer. It's got that SD card slot. It's got a great interface. I love that. But it doesn't sound quite as good as the others, and uh, the video playback wasn't quite as good either. OK, fair enough. Uh, how about the Alpine? How many Gs? for that. Three G's also for the Alpine. It does have that lovely sat nav you can take out and put it in other cars. It's very handy. It's got great video playback, but the iPod and sat nav interface wasn't the best. OK, which brings us to our final contender at the Kenwood. Four G's for the Kenwood. It is the most expensive, but you get probably marginally the best sound quality of the lot. You get pretty good video playback and also a very good sat nav interface. So overall, the best one. OK, so the Kenwood is the Gadget Show's in-car entertainment system of choice. If just an hour a week of the Gadget Show never seems quite enough, then you'll want to know about our weekly online show, Gadget Show Web TV. A new episode of Web TV is posted on our website every week of the year, even when we're not on the telly. Each week I review the latest tech, Dion brings you the most up-to-date gadget news and gossip, and Otis does his own web-exclusive investigations. As well as that, you'll find behind-the-scenes reports from Gadget Show Shoots and Jason's gaming page. To access the lot, go to 5.tv forward slash gadget show. Right, now it's time for the Wall of Fame. Each week on the Wall of Fame, Otis and I look at a particular gadget category, then choose an iconic gadget from that category, which we feel deserves a place on the much-vaunted wall. Once we've made our selection, we each make a pitch. The winner is decided by Judge John Bentley. And this week, it's all about the giants of arcade gaming, as we choose between Space Invaders and Street Fighter. I'm absolutely convinced that this arcade machine, Space Invaders, is not only the most important arcade machine ever made, it's the most important computer game ever made. Across every platform in every country, this simple, low-res 2D shooting game showed the world how brilliant computer gaming could be. Space Invaders isn't just an iconic arcade game. This little chappy has to be one of the most recognisable symbols 
on Earth. Originally, the game's inventor, Tomohiro Nishikado, wanted the marching enemy at the top of the screen to be human soldiers. But the game's manufacturers, Taito, didn't like the idea, thought that killing humans sent the wrong message, and so that concept was vetoed. They tried tanks, fighter planes and battleships, but due to the limitations of the graphics at their disposal, Nichikado couldn't get the movements to be realistic. Finally, after reading about a movie called Star Wars, he settled on aliens as the enemy. The game was first released in Japan in 1978, and it was an instant and massive success. Whole arcades open with nothing but these machines in them. And the game's nationwide success led to a shortage of the 100 yen coin. The beauty of Space Invaders lies in its simplicity. Look, at the bottom of the screen, I've got this spaceship here, which I move left to right. It's loaded with a big laser cannon, which I use to stop these marauding hordes of aliens coming down to land on my planet. That is it. In fact, why am I telling you this? Because everyone on Earth knows how to play Space Invaders. In 1980, Space Invaders was licensed for the Atari 2600, and sales of the home console quadrupled overnight. From being king of the arcade, Space Invaders now became the first ever killer app console game. I don't need to try and sell you Space Invaders. It's done that for itself to the tune of several hundred million pounds worth of business worldwide. And it's ranked in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most successful arcade game ever. Now, of the two of us, Jason is the proper gamer, which is why I believe, deep down, he knows that the real legend of the arcade is this, the incomparable Street Fighter. Let's rumble. When it was launched by Capcom in 1987, there were already several one-on-one -on -one personal combat games around. Indeed, the original Street Fighter looked very, very similar to the Konami fighting game 1-2 Kung Fu that had launched two years earlier. But the colours and characters leapt off the screen, and crucially, there was a two-player mode which allowed you to control a character whilst fighting the character controlled by somebody else. Now, each character had their own signature moves, which were notoriously difficult to master, and sometimes a bit random. Oh! The original Street Fighter was a moderate success, but it was its successor, Street Fighter II, launched in 91, which really took the arcades by storm and, well, beat all the other fighting games on the market into submission and left them licking their wounds in a skip just round the corner. Street Fighter II is still, in my mind, the finest fighting game ever created by anyone, anywhere. The gameplay was much faster and smoother than the original, and there was a wider range of characters to choose from. And, most importantly, practice really did make perfect. Special moves like the 100-hand slap and the sonic boom could be learned properly and honed to perfection. In Street Fighter 2, head-to-head combat became the primary game mode. Unlike earlier combat games, playing Street Fighter 2 needed real skill, and queues formed at machines around the world as local champions took on all comers, and a new breed of computer games geniuses was born. Street Fighter 2 moved onto the consoles and sold an incredible 14 million copies. Street Fighter 3 soon followed, and just last year, Street Fighter 4 shifted 116,000 copies on launch day in Japan. Now, the graphics may have gotten a lot slicker and faster, but it's that addictive head-to-head -head gameplay that still makes it a great game today. Street Fighter is so much more than just an arcade punch-up. It's the perfect model of how to construct a game. Hadouken! Both very interesting stories, gentlemen. Hugely impressive, as ever, but also, as ever, a couple of questions. Now, Jason, on Space Invaders, I mean, a brilliantly successful and innovative icon, but it's never developed like the Street Fighter franchise has. Isn't it just nostalgia? Franchise? Look, this isn't a chain of hamburger shops. <laughs> this is video gaming history. Look, I know what you're trying to get at, but I don't think that something this classic needs to evolve. I think it's just exquisite the way it is. It's as playable now as it was right back then in 1978. So you can't improve on it, is what you're saying? Absolutely. Mmm, Street Fighter Osis. I mean, marvels the way it continues to evolve. It's never had that universal appeal. It's never extended beyond the world of gaming like Space Invaders did. What Street Fighter 2 did for gaming is the equivalent of strapping nitrous oxide to the engine of your motorbike. Millions of people took joystick in hand and bash buttons courtesy of this, and dare I say it, was the beginning of hardcore gaming? as we know it today. Oh, this is difficult. <laughs>
You've no idea how difficult this is. Oh, but I think if you can imagine a wall without one of these, the one it would be most difficult to imagine it without is... Space Invaders. Oh, because it was that innovative icon. It, it was. was. so pioneering and it is so universally known throughout the world. And for those reasons, it deserves its place on the Gadget Show's Wall of Fame. I couldn't have said it better myself. Welcome back. Now it's time to return to this week's wind-based challenge. Stop it now. <laughs> <laughs> and for this part of the challenge, Gay and I decided to just dial down the competitiveness a notch or two and just have some physical fun on the beach. That, that didn't sound <laughs> right, did it? No, it didn't. It was windswept, it was chilly, but it was awesome because we were charged with finding the top five gadget show kites. Kites come in many shapes and sizes and are used for everything from having fun with your kids in the park to pulling awesome tricks and carving some big ear when kite surfing. We've chosen the best kites in five different categories to help you make the right choice and to test them we were back on Western Supermare Beach. Woo At number five, it's the single line EOLO Sports Spy Kite, the first kite to include a built-in camera. Now, this is a very, very cool kite. It's like having your own little hand gliding paparazzi. Could you see here? I've got a camera. Brilliant. And I've got here the remote control. OK, so you ready to let it I'm, go? I'm more okay. than ready. Ready? Go! 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 Woo! 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 The camera takes fairly low res pictures. And in a strong wind, we weren't too accurate with our snaps. But as a means of taking photos up to 25 metres in the air, it can be beat. The kite itself has a fiberglass frame and lightweight ripstop nylon sail, so it's pretty tough in case you get spotted and need to do an emergency landing. At number four, it's a sports kite, the HQ Yukon. A tough all-rounder, perfect for tricks in all weathers. Okay, Gail. Oh, just look at that go into the air. It's beautifully balanced. This is the perfect little stunt kite. It's got a very deep sail. So it's good for winds of up to 24 miles an hour, which we're not far off today. And it's got a mix in its frame of carbon fibre and fibreglass, which means it's very, very strong. It's gorgeous. And as Gail will tell you, as a very new kite flyer, it's actually really easy to fly, isn't it? It's not too bad at all. Oh! Great moves, Gail. Do your little spinny thing again. Beautifully controlled. <laughs> to a point. <laughs> Swooping in at number three is a four-line power kite, the Flexifoil Rage. Arr! Power kites are designed to pull you along, so it can be used on the beach for solo flying or to power you on land or water. This is the daddy of the kites we're testing in the top five. It's very delicately balanced between these four lines. The two at the top, they're the control lines. They're your steering wheel, OK? The two at the back are your brakes. So it's a combination of moving those in various positions Gives you movement, gives you power, and also stability. I'll try and demonstrate. I'm just going to move it to the left, and then if I pull it to the right with a bit of power, I should be able to move my body along the sand. Like that. Woo! <laughs> the large wingtips of the Rage help it to track and turn better. Woo! And the sail is made from saw and nylon, a special Japanese fabric which is double coated for strength. It's so responsive, it's also quite scary. But I like that about it. Flying in at number two, it's an entry-level power kite, the Peter Lynn Vibe. It's perfect for those new to the exciting sport of power kiting. Ready, Gail? You ready? Let's go! Woo-hoo-hoo! -hoo! The Vibe has a 1.9-metre sail, cross-vented so it easily fills with air and therefore improves stability. It's got a very low aspect ratio, which means it's quite deep, which creates a lot of drag, and that means it's a little more docile as power kiting goes. It's a great combination of manoeuvrability and ease of flying. Look at it go, it looks beautiful. And then straight back up. Can I have a go? And even for a novice flyer like me. Oh, look at that. It's a beautiful thing. I found it really simple to get started on. And number one kite is a trick kite, the Aerostuff Fury, a precision device for high speed stunts. 
Now, the Fury that our lovely Jason is playing with here has what is known in kite circles as a very large win window, which means basically the area in which you can fly your kite in. It's got a frame that is made limited edition from Japan. It's also got polyester steel instead of nylon, which means it's nippy enough to do some amazing tricks like the Lazy Susan, the Flick Flack, the Comet, and then and Jace shows the twizzle! Right, oh. the twizzle! Designed by world sport kite champion Carl Robert Shaw, the Fury has been handmade as the ultimate competition kite, with a hefty 250cm wingspan and that limited edition aero stuff frame made of wrapped carbon fibre, which is light but very stiff. It's like a really expensive sports car, you know, it's delicate, it's elegant, and it's really, really powerful and manoeuvrable. Look at that, look at that! Oh, just fantastic! Kite flying, you cannot beat it. And this thing, the Fury, is superb and, and actually involves some super high-tech materials for a relatively small amount of money. You know, even a novice can get this thing and be making shapes in the sky pretty quickly. You mastered it very quickly. And you weren't so bad yourself, Miss Porter. Look, uh, kites aside, mm. I've got some snazzy mobile phone tech to show you. Would you like to come outside with me? Oh, yes, Morris. please. We'd say no. You're going to love this. It's called Nokia Point and Find, OK? All you need is a Nokia phone and an application that I've just brought up there. And you can see it started the video camera rolling. Now, what Nokia have done is they've gone around and they've tagged a bunch of posters, all right? OK. I'll show you why. If I just point this camera, look, without pressing a button, I'll just point at this Ice Age 3 poster. This info is coming live from the internet. It works with other stuff. Come and have a look. OK, look at this. This is a poster for an exhibition in London. Can you see it almost instantly? Two for one. Information for tickets, two for one. Look. Uh, body world's information, terms and conditions, that sort of thing. It all pops up. But as well as posters, they're going to roll it out to include shopping as well. It gives you access to the barcodes on products. You can get product reviews. And prices and yeah, everything. it's brilliant. Just from having that application really, on your phone. It really could well be an application that we all use an awful lot in the future. You may remember at the end of the last series of The Gadget Show, we asked for your help with the design of a new gadget. We wanted to build the ultimate gadget chair and so asked you to send in your designs. You guys, as always, were brilliant and you sent in hundreds of top-notch designs. But before we could build anything, we had to decide which of your designs to go with. Our gadget chair challenge had certainly got you lot thinking. We had a raft of cracking design entries to go through and whittling them down was a really tough job. He has certainly thought about housing stuff, iPod dock, trackpad, split keyboard. So this is getting more towards it, isn't it? I like the way he keeps the floor clear, though. But after a lot of analysis and debate, we finally came to a decision on which one we wanted to build. And it was... The G-Chair, designed by 14-year-old gadget show fan Ben Rain from Coventry. Actually, it does so many of the jobs that we're looking for it to do. We felt Ben's G-Chair design had everything you'd want in a gadget chair. And crucially, it seemed buildable. But as project manager, I was going to need some help to make Ben's design a reality. So, after a bit of searching, I found a team of experts to take on our gadget chair challenge. Specialist engineers Simon Oldfield and Stuart Parrish, and the brains behind the gadget show's gravity racer, engineer David Aykroyd. OK, this is the design. It's going to be a fully loaded chip. It's going to have at least two games consoles, right. uh, a mini fridge, um, That'll be nice. Uh, and um, a screen here, will that work? Yeah. We need to keep the monitor in line of sight at all points when reclining the back. So maybe we can mount the monitor on the headrest? If we, That's a good idea. Yeah. If we connect it from the headrest, yeah, that would probably be the best way. So as we build, we might have to change one, two things when we look at what we're putting in the chair. OK, so realistically speaking, the finished chair may look a little, a little different. bit different, okay. yeah, I think. So we set to work tweaking the design on paper, in particular moving the monitor display, expanding the speaker system to incorporate surround sound and adding fans to cope with the heat from all that tech. As it was the sheer amount of gadgets inside that was going to make this chair unique. Right, this is all the kit we want to fit into the gadget chair. As you can see, it's a lot of stuff. And this is a plan of the space that we want to fit most of the kit into. Anyone for Tetris? So I began to work out just how we were going to fit them all in, including the massive subwoofer that will provide some bone-shaking bass. 
And for the rest of the chair, we started to see just how it was all going to come together. That's it, and just tilt those fellas in a little bit. Yeah, proper surround sound. Nice. With a few added design touches. Lighting. If we can have like small LED strips to decorate the sides of the chair and then underneath the chair, some kind of light, red light maybe, that will just give the chair that... So, having done some serious brainstorming, our plan soon moved from paper to CAD, or computer-aided design, where any design issues could be ironed out, including fitting in that subwoofer. I think the fact that the chair won't then just look like a square yeah, block, because it's, it's going to taper, taper back. Out, taper out. It, it will look like pretty. Yeah, out the yes, I chair. like that. It will look, it will look <laughs> prettier. It will look sexier. We had a plan, we had a load of gadgets, so it was time to build the thing. We were using aluminium for much of the frame to keep the weight down and give it strength, and were able to transfer the data from the CAD into multiple tool machines to shape the chair's panels and incorporate the Gadget Show logo, of course. Look at that. This chair, this gadget chair, is going to look good. While the boys carried on constructing the frame, I paid a visit to the upholsterers to choose materials and lend a hand putting together the chair fabrics. OK, to whoever wins this chair, I'm doing my best, OK? If there's a wonky bit on your armrest, you're just going to have to live with it. Over the next couple of weeks, my team at Graham Parish Engineering were hard at work on the build, as I kept in touch with them dealing with any problems as they arose. We're just putting the subwoofer in. And is it still going to fit where we want it to? Yes. Yes, it's, yeah. it's going to sit at the back of the chair, so it's, like, pointing out the back. And before long, our gadget chair, inspired by Ben's design, was becoming a glorious reality. And here it is, the ultimate gadget chair. It's taken a few weeks and around £5,000, and I'm sure you're going to like it. Can we just unveil it now, just... oh, Wait, Jason, just have a bit of a ceremony first. Drum roll, please. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please be upstanding and show a modicum of excitement for the ultimate gadget chair. This is... This is awesome, man. <laughs> I'm absolutely loving this. Check it out. How well equipped is this? Look, inside the arm, I've got all of my controllers, look. In hand-billeted aluminium there, look, Wii, Xbox 360, uh, PS3, I'm just playing with there. If I whack up my 5.1 surround sound system, isn't that great? Uh, just with one touch of my thumb, I can move through the HDMI uh, multi-switcher. Look, there's the Xbox 360. Um, Another clip will bring up my PC where I can watch some DVDs or surf the web or do whatever. Uh, I've got an iPod dock. You've got a little widget at the back there, haven't you? Yep. It's a bit I love most of all. Ready? Yep. OK. Oh. Keep it going while I play. I like it. Welcome back, and now let's get down to the important business of testing some rather tough gadgets. Yes, and it's very clear that you lot love it when we get violent with tech that claims to be rugged. Yes, so uh, for your delectation, two compact, tough cameras and three ways which we can loosely interpret as in some way involving wind, uh, where we test them to destruction and possibly beyond. To test our rugged cameras, we'd gone to a helicopter graveyard and got ready to get all rusty tufty. If you're like me and you have a bit of a rugged lifestyle, then you need a ruggedized camera, a camera that's tougher than Vin Diesel's underpants. <laughs> yeah, you need a camera that's almost indestructible for extreme sports and really chaotic children's parties, because they're quite intense, aren't they? They are seriously yeah. intense. We've got two of the most rugged cameras available. Let's see how tough they really are. My rugged camera of choice was this, the Olympus Tough 6000. This 10 megapixel camera is shockproof to one and a half meters, waterproof to three meters, and freeze-proof to minus 10 degrees Celsius. Whereas I'd gone for the Ricoh G600, also with 10 megapixels. It's also shockproof to one and a half meters, water resistant to one meter, and dust resistant. First up, we'd set up a photo shoot with model Hannah to see how her cameras performed under normal conditions. Could you look that way? but really sort of forlorn. My Ricoh's not only ruggedy, but they haven't scrimped on the spec either. With a five times optical zoom and a 2.7 inch LCD display, my images were sharp and clear. I mean, that's that's a really nice shot, isn't it? My Olympus wasn't bad either. Right, that's it, sexy. With a 3.6 times optical zoom plus face detection and shadow adjustment, it was dead easy to use and in our photo shoot was producing some lovely results. 
Mine's just working perfectly. You know, it's the sort of thing I'd use every day with my daughter and stuff. It's easy, it's quick, it's taking beautiful pictures. So, not much between our cameras under standard conditions then, but how would they cope with something a little more extreme? Push the on button on the storm machine! Yes, it was time to fire up some wind and rain to test our cameras in the sort of weather you might find on, say, a British August bank holiday. Oh, that's great! That's absolutely brilliant! These were tough conditions, but both our cameras were designed for underwater use, with mine waterproof to three metres, and that's not all. I've got this setting on my camera. It's a tap setting. You can tap twice on the top, press OK, and then I can set everything just by tapping on the side of the camera, which means I don't have to worry about fiddly, fiddly buttons with my gloves on. Well, these are pretty good conditions to test my camera, which is supposed to be waterproof to up to one metre. I'm also finding that even with these big, thick gloves on, the kind of gloves you'd wear in horrible weather, the buttons are still really easy to use because they're raised. Well, both cameras had withstood the fury of our storm and even taken some half-decent snaps. So once we'd dried out a bit, it was time for the next challenge, shock resistance. Both our cameras claim to be able to withstand falls onto a variety of surfaces from one and a half metres, but we wanted to up the ante. We were going up to a height of 10 metres to see if either camera would survive the fall and as an extra challenge to see if we could take a mid-air snap of our sunbathing mannequins below, which meant attaching a rope, a tube and a clamp to make sure the lens would point straight down in flight, a challenge we like to call kamikaze paparazzi. Keep her going, I want to sniff the clouds. I was up first with my Rico. We're at 10 metres. It's a serious test for the Rico, way beyond what its manufacturer says it's capable of withstanding. Are you ready down there? Ready! OK, just setting the timer. Oh, 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 I felt the ground shake! That was a huge stud on impact, but thanks to its shock-resistant structure, the Rico would remain defiantly intact. I'm going to check it. How's it looking? Is it damaged? It's working! Fantastic hey. news! And the digital image stabilisation had helped to capture an excellent mid-flight image too. However, a hairline crack on the front was a cause for concern. Time to see how my Olympus would fare. Bye! Bradbury, ready! Porter, ready! Get out the little camera, oh. coming! And it's going to take a real bashing as it oh. smacks onto the ground. Oh. It works! Yes! Incredibly, it had survived without a scratch, and its dual image stabilisation had helped grab a great snap on the way down too. Well done! So it was still neck and neck as we headed into our final ordeal, which would test our camera's video modes in extreme conditions. We've come up with a test which is going to give us really exciting video footage and also it's the ultimate test of the rugged durability of our cameras. Say hello to the scaffold of doom. Yes, we were going to suspend our cameras above an explosion and set their video modes running. To survive, our cameras would need to withstand dust, explosive impact and fire. The Rico is dust resistant, but neither camera claims to be fireproof. This was going to be very interesting indeed. Five, four, three, three two, two, one. one. Explosion! Oh! Oh! Wow! Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's got to look. Nicely cooked, I think. Mine is working. Look at that, mine's working too. Incredibly, apart from some mud and light charring, both cameras were virtually unharmed. And we were able to play back some great video from right above the explosion. <laughs> oh! But our appetite for destruction wasn't satisfied yet. We wanted to find out just how much punishment these cameras could take. So this time, we positioned them right on top of some more explosives. Five, four, three, two, one, bang! Where'd they go? So the big question is, did our rugged digital cameras survive that big blast? Yeah, that was quite a something, that explosion, wasn't it? And the, the question is, uh, when they returned from the stratosphere, were they anywhere to be found? Well, I found mine and it's broken. <laughs> Great, I found my battery and, uh, you know what, I can't say whether it's broken or not because I've not got the bit, I think it's called the camera, yeah. that goes with it. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, if you saw a blackened compact camera flying past you and it's still on your lawn, grab it, I'll send you the battery, you can tell me whether it's still working or not. So that means if I found this camera... 
Yes, it does mean that you won the test. Yes, won the test! Which is, which is absolutely brilliant. It also means that we found two really reliable, rugged, compact cameras in the Ricoh and the Olympus. Remember, both of them, until that ridiculous blast at the end, were working perfectly <laughs> well. I'm pleased that you won, though, you know. Why? Be because this is, of course, oh. Gail's last show. It is indeed. You were amazing. You've, you've been a fantastic member of the team, Gail. I've loved every minute of it. Thank you very much for having me. We're all going to miss you massively. Thanks. Nice big kiss. Right on, on that the bold <laughs> bombs, on that bombshell. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Not me.